Right. Okay. Sorry. 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 Right. Okay. That's it. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Let's see. The reason I'm sitting there is because I, I forgot to put my phone in the airplane mode. Okay. Um, no but I don't want to shut this down. Let's just go with it. Let's just. Okay. Uh, I'm waiting for uh, <clears throat> StreamYard to, to go live. Because it is six. Okay. And what's going on? Hmm. <clears throat> Let's see. I don't have an internet connection problem, so I think it says live now, doesn't it? Yeah. Are we? No, we're not on. It's weird. It says live here. It says live? Yeah. Really? It live. Yeah, it says That's live. Good. Okay, hold on a second. Oh, it uh, stopped. Okay. It stopped again, then it started again. Okay, hold on, because I don't okay. know. All right, so not a good thing to start with today. That's okay. We'll just get, we'll just improvise through it. Okay. That's weird because I don't see the live message. I've got the live up in the left here. It's at 26 seconds. Yeah. Okay. But it, it went okay. away a few, it went away. Okay. Now, now it's there. Now, it's there. finally. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank God. Well, good afternoon to all and welcome to Coffee Time. <laughs> Acá, cuéntamelo con un café. We have changed. There have been changes. Um, change in the logo, change in the name, change in my hair. And it's great to be back after this mid-long break. And I couldn't be happier than to have this guest today live with us. And here I go with the presentation. So our guest of today is a Scottish filmmaker, actor, and also producer at Wild Entertainment. He first got into acting by writing, directing, and acting in his first industry-funded feature. According to him, his first film was not a great experience, and this made him lose interest and passion for acting and filmmaking. But several years later, he returned to filmmaking when the technology gave him more freedom to be creative. He wanted to learn to be a filmmaker from scratch, but making films and acting on his own terms to learn inexpensively. He studied at the Lee Strasberg Institute, the Scottish Youth Theatre, and the City Lit Course Convent Garden. Since he started in 2000, He's written, directed, acted, produced, and edited more than 28 projects, such as TV series Crime Lord, available on Amazon Prime and Apple TV, the video shorts The Life of a CO, School Girl, School Girl, School Girl, School Girl Killer, and short films Nikki N, The Trip, The Godmother, Preda the Godmother Predators, Cyber Gangster, and the feature films Crime Lord, bestseller, skin flick, cold-blooded killers, amongst others. His most recent project in creation in, is the creation of Wild One Films, a new blockchain film company with an NFT exclusive membership being the anthology series Mad World, the first project filming in process, which he will later explain to us. David Wild, welcome. Hi there, Yasmin. Very, um, a very, uh, a very grand in introduction. I don't know if I deserve. <laughs> well, of course you do, David. You deserve this much more. Thank, thank, thanks very much for the invite on here. I really appreciate it. 
Mm. Now, I thank you for being available and for, for having um, this mm. afternoon to be able to, to share some, some of you and yourself and all your experience with us in just one hour time. So we will have to make it quick. Let's start with the questions. Tell us, David, how and when did it all start? Um, I really start. I started off want to be. I didn't want to be an actor. I just um, there was a local community youth club, and I actually went there to try and meet girls. Um, it wasn't to do with acting, and I went there, and the girls weren't very good looking. <laughs> so, so I ended up getting into the acting. I got you know it was a children's acting company, doing plays and stuff, and I get the bug. And it kind of went from there. So the acting was more of the interest. That was in the door. Filmmaking or writing didn't exist. It was mainly acting at the very start, you know. Who um, you to become an actor and filmmaker? I actually get no inspiration to be a, an actor, filmmaker for many actors. My father did take me to the cinema in the 70s. He took mm -hmm. me to see Jaws and Close Encounters and The Godfather when he came to VHS and, you know, watched all those early VHS movies in the cinema. Um, as well. So I probably had that subconscious side of it, cinema, but it was so unattainable. It was so out there that it was just like, I never even thought I'd be getting into acting, you know. Um, but it must have been in my subconscious, you know, from back then. Hmm. Have you always had your family support? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, look, my family, like most families, if you say you want to be an actor, that's just like you know, especially years, not so much today, but back when I started, it wasn't really a, a thing, you know. Um, yeah. But I went, I left Scotland, I went to London, and I get more in, you know, a different kind of world there. And uh, yeah, my family always, um, especially when I made my first feature film, they really helped on my first feature film to get that, to get that moving. So yeah, you know, um, they, they never discouraged me from the creative industries, even though they weren't part of it. You know, they were never part of the creative industries. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So you have worked as an actor and as a director in both film and TV. Which do you prefer and why? Probably um, the I like equally both, but probably the filmmaking is more because I'm more in control of things. You know, um, acting, you're very out of control. You're waiting for the next role, as you know, you and you don't even know if you'll get. It's quite a strange thing because... People want to do their dream job. And if you get your dream job in acting, it might not always be the right part for you. You could go years trying to get the right part. So I used to find that frustrating at the start. I get an acting role and it's like, this isn't really me or whatever. So probably the filmmaking when I started writing, at least I could sit down, I could write. I was in control of that without any money. Nobody had to call me up. Um, so probably the filmmaking. But even though I do like acting because when you, when you go on set as an actor, know your lines, do the part, you can walk away. Um, as a director, you're in control of everything and it's continuing on for a long period of time. So um, I kind of like both, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I like that side, you're not in control as much as an actor as well. The double side of that, you know. You don't have to worry about all the other stuff, you know. Yeah. Which do you like most, film, TV or theatre? Um, I started off in theatre, done some theatre, and the good thing about theatre was, whereas an actor's completely control of the performance, where in film they're not control yet. You know, if you go on stage, obviously, that's you, you fly with it until the end, but in mm -hmm. film, it's them, they're grabbing it. They, so I like theatre, but I've had such a gap from theatre that now it scares me, <laughs> you know what I mean? But you should do things that, scares, things that scare you. Um, but probably... Film because of, that's what I do. That's where I've been more in control. Of, writing, directing, producing. That's the process that I'm used to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, you know, some it's probably, you know, but I'd probably like to do a play in the future, you know, just because it is scary and confront your fears, you know. Um, yeah, you know, probably acting and filmmaking is the main thing, though. You know, of the projects in which you have participated um, as of today. Which is your favourite project and why? I don't really have any favourites at all because almost I'm almost like him from the very first film that I've done, I almost feel that after I've done something, I want to burn it, you know. Um, it's almost like I don't want to know about it. I don't want to, well, I'll promote it, but I don't want to <laughs> reflect on it. I don't want to think about it because um, 
it's never the project that you want. You never you never have the money to do the vision that you want to do. You never so, but learning the process of making films to get up the ladder, it's almost like a, a technical process. I've learned how to do that better. I've learned how to do this, and then maybe one day, before I die, maybe one day I can do my Citizen Kane rather than reverse where Austin Wells did his Citizen Kane and it killed him. <laughs> you know, after mm-hmm. that, I'm trying to do it in reverse where. As I get older, I could do a project. Before I die, I could go, oh, I've got a hang of it. I've done something that I'm really proud of. So that, I, I work in reverse that way, you know. But that, don't you think that in this industry, we are um, quite perfectionist and we are never happy with what we've done? We think, yeah. we always think we could have done better. Absolutely. I mean, but I think you always should have that attitude because it's a, your bar should be a way up there. You never reach it. Yeah. You've also got to recognise that perfectionism is a neurosis. You can never reach it. It's impossible. You know, I know a lot of filmmakers that will sit there and edit their projects for months and years, and it will never be perfection. So you have to have the attitude. You make this. It's not perfect. You ship it. It goes. You go into the next project. Almost like an artist and a painter, and it's it's rough, and there's something raw and beautiful about that, and you let it go, and you fly, and you try and get make better the next one. If you sit there with a perfectionist attitude, it's quite a neurotic state. You won't really get anything done. Do you know what I mean? Um, even even the big Hollywood movies like Christopher Nolan makes. I remember seeing an interview a few weeks ago and somebody asked about Christopher Nolan says he's a perfectionist. He goes, no, there's a few takes, move on. Because if you've got 400 people in the crew, you can't be a perfectionist at like Stanley Kubrick. You have to yeah. move on. Do you know what I mean? So, um, I yeah, probably well, swayed, from, sorry, I probably swayed from the question. I forget the question. No, 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 no. It's, it's great. It's yeah. great. It's yeah. that, uh, I think I remember Stanley Kubrick in one of his films, he um, shot for the same scene 200 yeah. minutes. Yeah, <laughs> Stanley, um, Steve, uh, Harvey Keitel walked off his set because he asked him to close the door about 100 times and he was yeah. having enough of us. Um, Stanley Kubrick wouldn't be allowed to do those films today. You know, it's too expensive as a corporate, you know. Um, yeah. you know. So that was obviously Stanley's time and Stanley's, you know, you know, the man was a genius, but that, he wouldn't be allowed to do that today, you know. Well, I understand how, how, how this guy felt, this actor felt, because, I mean, I didn't go up to 100 times, but I did walk beside a car for 34 times. And I thought that, you know, it was quite enough walking next to the car 34 times. Um, but, well, you know, it's exactly... I, mean, I, th- I think sometimes that's when a director doesn't, apart from some, somebody like Kubrick or... Um, that's when a director really doesn't know what they want. You know, if I know, I, I'll go through a few takes and go, bang, we've got it, and that's it. If you have to go 34 times, you know, I don't think it's good, you know. Um, and I, I understand, in my case, the director, he, he would he would say, just in case, let's do another one. So we ended up calling him just in case. Director just, <laughs> just, I mean, in, was case. just in case. No. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean that uncertainty you always will have it so i mean might as well go on and move on and just go to the next because otherwise think, finish. yeah, uh, yeah. You, you don't the thing is you don't want to drain the actors you really sure. don't want to drain them out you want to keep them fresh and you know you know mm-hmm. in my experience anyway you know yeah no no totally totally agree um is there a project that you have regretted doing or that has not been as satisfactory for you as you would have wished yeah, <laughs> my first ever feature film, um, which is my first industry funded feature film that was shot in Scotland and America. And actually, I had wrote better scripts before that, but then I wrote a script. They were looking for those type of comedy movies and caper movies at the time. And I thought, this might be the right timing. And of course, they loved it and they went with it. But it got changed along the way, it got stretched, it got bent out of shape, it got this way. Mm-hmm. And I actually made the movie that I didn't like and I hated and it was my first film. And I hated it so much that it almost destroyed me for eight years. I never made a film for eight years, you know. Wow. Um, I never even considered acting or filmmaking for eight years after it. And then went to the cinema, went to television, it was out there. Um, but I learned, I, I, I shouldn't have um, tortured myself so much about it because I shot it on film all over the world before digital. Um, so it was almost like a film school. So if I just took the experience from learning how to make a film, even though it wasn't a good film. Um, but, you know, I've since learned from that, let that go, you know. So that was probably the worst experience, was the first, ironically, the first film that I got funded, 
you know, because you've got executives over your shoulder, you've got people putting the fingers in the pie, you know, um, that I was too green to deal with. Today, I'm much more experienced. I could deal with that much better, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was the first film, yeah, you know. I mean, it's part of the process anyway, so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you do have great filmmakers who have done, you know, a bit shitty work too. And oh, yeah, of course. Kill them and they just went on and, and do the next one. The next one will be better and, you know. Absolutely. We, you know, in, in this industry is, is is hard enough for us to be that hard on ourselves. So I sometimes I just say, OK, you know, just take a deep breath and move on. And whatever happens, whatever is supposed to happen will happen anyways. So just move on. Keep moving. Uh, take, what you, take what you can from it, you know. Yeah, absolutely. According to you, what are the three qualities that every actor should have? Oh, Okay, oh, there, there, there should be many more, but let's just keep it. Yeah. Okay, I, I think the top of the list, people think that talent is the top of the list. To me, talent isn't the top of the list. You've got to have talent, but I've, I've met and I've worked with so many talented people that have went downhill, went off the rails because they never had their attitude right. You know, they never had, I think you have to be a package. So the, the top thing is in the list, I think, you have to have some talent, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 don't get don't get too enthusiastic if you've got some natural talent because you have to develop that and constantly learn every project you do. So you have to have some talent. You also have to have some. Um, you have to, to. I think today you have to be a package. You have to learn. It's not just about putting yourself out there in your showreel. You have to learn social media. You have to learn how you sell yourself. You have to learn how you brand yourself to yourself and your brand. That's just a. That's just a fact because. If you've got somebody that's just as talented, but that they don't go on social and they don't promote themselves, and somebody does do that, and they're just as talented, that person's getting the part, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you have to, I think you have to have a resilience for the long term. You know, this is a long, long term journey. Um, if somebody told you at the very start act and that there would be a mountain that you've got to climb, and then when you get up there, don't start celebrating because there's another fifty ahead. <laughs> Um, that if you want to be at the top of your, if you want to earn it as a, as a living, then I mean, you take a top movie star like Tom Cruise. If Tom Cruise had let his guard down after Top Gun, the first movie, I've made it. Then it, it may end up like many actors go and disappear. You know, constantly on the game, constantly pushing, constantly. Even though I'm not a big fan of Tom Cruise, but what I mean by it is that you have to keep pushing yourself and keep disciplined and keep love the process. You know, I think loving the process so that you can prepare yourself for the ups and downs. I think resilience, mm -hmm. um, humility, you know, um, constantly want to learn, you know, and brand building yourself and be a and multi multitasker. You have to be entrepreneurial because you may have to have a day job for years and years and years that you can cope with well as well as going for your acting, you know. Um, I probably mixed that all up, but... I think I think all those things, you know, um, as an actor, you have to, you know, just learn your skill, build yourself up, be in it for the long road, you know. Um, I'm sure there's many things you can add yourself, you know, there. Um, I mean, Tom, going back to Tom Cruise, he's um, he's a sort of a DIY actor, um, and all he now he all he needs is just to learn a lot of languages because I mean, and then he could be yeah. Uh, he could be dubbing his own films, and then he wouldn't I, need. I, I mean, it in the I mean, it in the sense that put it this way: that if you become successful, take anybody. If you become successful tomorrow, you think I've arrived, right? After my first feature film experience, making a film, and I was acting in it, everybody told me you've arrived. You know, you've been in LA, you're on posters, and and it's like, no, you have got to have that same push and drive, because suddenly the game's a bit higher. Then you've got agents on board, they're pushing you for this project. And push. So you've constantly got to be on top of your game and push yourself. You cannot, you know, slacken off. And then and then you get, if you get successful, you may get projects that are purely money-driven by the agents, the one you do it. So you've got to have a, a sense in your head for the long term that how, what, how do I want to make this fun for myself and do projects that may be commercial and projects that may be interesting. That one can pay the rent. This one can be creatively fulfilling. You know, and 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 ride this long road. You know, um, I think there's so many. I think, but the the one biggest thing that I've learned about actors is that they seem to think that just because they've got some acting talent, that's it. 
you know, they don't seem to need anything else. Unfortunately, it is true. Unfortunately, they you do know. take um, they do they do take it for granted, and it's not it's not true. It's 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 hard work. Uh, I always say that um, your your acting career or your um, filming career it's just like a marriage. I mean, it's it's easy to date. It's easy well, to date the bride next to you. But the thing is, you know, keeping the marriage together for so many years is the hard part. Put it this and, way: look at look at some of the great directors, right? They work with a lot of the same people over years. You know, John Cassavetes always worked with the same cast. Martin mm -hmm. Scorsese always worked with De Niro and DiCaprio. And the reason for being, if you get an ensemble people that you can work with well, you know, then you tend to bring those people back. And yeah. there's so many people that don't seem to think on a long term basis. That's why our directors always work with a lot of the same people because um, actors seem to, there's a lot of actors burn their bridges. They don't seem to realize what they're doing. You know, um, it's a collaboration. You want to work with the best people. Do you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. making a film is like going to war. You're in the trenches, so you want to have each other's back. You know, you don't want to be creating problems and actors that have got, you know, you don't want divas on there that create problems and slow people that, you know. So it's, uh, I think uh, just uh, realizing this is a long game and 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 just just have fun with it, you know. Yeah, I always say I don't want people to bring drama behind the camera. I want people to bring drama in front of the camera. If you're playing crazy, do it in front of the camera when it rolls. But don't give me any drama behind the camera and deep shit because that is just going to, you know. I, like in Crime Lord, um, I've got Stephen who I've cast in all my films. He's so easy to work with. I don't have to talk. We don't have to talk much. We've got a, a shorthand. Always reliable. So I, I write parts for people that I got on with well. I keep writing parts for people. I'm, I'm bringing him back. I'm bringing him back. You know, um, but there's a lot of actors you up with go, they'll never come back again. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, too much problems. Yeah, you know? yeah I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I've seen that my I've seen it myself. I mean. Um, we all have our um, our ups and downs. We all have our, our characters and, and 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 our personalities. And but I'm the type of, of talent that um, I love to work in an ongoing and nice environment um, and set. Uh, like yourself, I don't like working with people who think they are divas behind or in front of the camera because I just find it it makes it so much more difficult and hard and it takes such a long time to finish the project. Yeah. So uh, the easier it is and the faster we get done with it and we enjoy the whole thing. So yeah. um, I, I, I agree. I totally agree with you. Talent but, is very important, but, but it's not being, enough. being an ongoing person is much more. Um, I'll be honest. We have picked many people that actually have no acting experience over people with acting experience because of their attitude and because yeah. of the professionalism and because of the reliability, the looseness, that they're not mm -hmm. trained too strong. They don't have, they, they haven't been trained, so they don't know the rules, so they break the rules as well, you know. So uh, I work with people that if I think they've got an energy and a fire and they're very fun to be with, and if mm -hmm. I can get what I need in that role from them, I'll cast in that role. So I don't just cast actors, I'll cast non-actors. I've done that many times, you know. Yeah, I, I totally you know. agree with you. And uh, going back with the qualities, the three qualities, um, what are the three qualities that you consider every director should have? Oh, um, directors are overrated. You know, I think they're overrated. You know, mm -hmm. um, if you're a writer-director, I think it's a bit more you get, you're bringing your vision there, but directors are a bit more over. I think directors shouldn't direct so much. <laughs> you think directing is telling people what to do. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think... You definitely have to know how to work with actors. And a lot of great directors didn't know how to work with actors at the start. Ridley Scott confessed he didn't know how to work with actors in his very early days. I think a, a, a good director, um, the problem with some directors is they can get all the technical people ready and, mm -hmm. and focus very technical because they're very technical, some of them, and they forget about the actors and they forget about the actors' process and really they're in front of the camera. It doesn't matter how good your technical is if you don't have those performances. So I think you have to learn how to work with actors. I think that's why maybe a lot of actor-directors work better because they know the acting process. So I think if you can learn the act... You don't need to be an actor to be a great director, but I think you have to learn the process, uh, actors, and set a good environment for them and say you can play here, you can do this. We've set up technically here. You can go crazy here. Do your thing and leave them. 
don't direct too much. The like Woody Allen doesn't direct too much, and you know, even Martin Scorsese has been says he sets a technical scene and then he'll let the actors fly, you know. And a lot of great actors say, I don't really want to be directed, I want to be, and then some great actors say, I do want to be directed because I want to know where I can go and where I can't. So, I think don't over direct, um, and I think, um, listening to people as well, listen to suggestions, being open to suggestions, being open to changes, and for me personally, which is also probably writing, being a writer director, if somebody says, I'm not too strict about the lines, if somebody mm -hmm. says, Can I change that to this? If I know they're changing it for a valid reason that it sounds more natural, I'll go with that. I can let my ego go. If they just mm -hmm. want to change it because they want to put their fingerprint on it and says, I contributed to the script, then I won't let it go. I say, say the fucking line. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so I think being open and be loose and being creative and being kind of organic. Also, I think Kubrick made a, a quote that I, didn't, if I understand. He says, I, I don't always know what I want, but I know a thousand percent what I don't want. Um, and I always found that, that I don't always know exactly what I want, but I know exactly what, I know precisely what I don't want. And that, that way it leaves interpret it leaves um, creativity open. Like if I if I went to a production designer and I say I know exactly what I want, then that's mm -hmm. killing their that's killing their talent and their skills. I want to obviously use their skills and their talent. So I says, I, I think I want this, I think and then they bring, they become more creative. I say to an actor, hey, well, let's see me let's see how you interpret it. You know, I'm not gonna say an actor, you can play it this way and you can play it that way. Just let's see what they do, let them fly with it. And they might surprise me beyond the script and then I'm open to that let's go with that you know so I think you have to be open and and, and no be your mind has to be open and you get some directors that will say I'm such a visionary <laughs> but then you're killing everybody else's talent because I think if you've got the exact film that you envisaged at the end of it I think you've slightly made a mistake because people should contribute things to it that make it better you know, and if they don't contribute things that make it better, then you've got exactly what you wanted, you know. So I think you've just got to be open. I think you've got to be loose. I think you've got to be a people person because if you've got a crew that are going to, you know, I've learned over the years that people will jump through fire for you if you respect them and treat them well. But mm -hmm. if you treat them like a director, and you know, and all that, you know, it's the old school. Um, you know, I, I'm not, that's why I left a lot of acting jobs because directors were so bad that was like oh, I don't need this shit you know so yeah I just think um, I don't know that many things that I, I also think as a director you have to be a salesperson because you have to go out there and sell the film and promote it and plug it and you can't be shy and you can't, you can't be you know I'm creative I think you have to be a bit of your package that way look at your Tarantino's you know a, a, you know he's a rock star director basically so the director's name becomes a brand look at George Lucas Woody Allen Tarantino David Lynch the other so as you say those names you know what those 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 films represent so I think yeah. if you want to be a filmmaker which to me personally I haven't got to that level I'm still to try to find my brand and my name and my stamp and hopefully I do that before I die so I think you have to get your stamp and your uniqueness so that when people say it's a Woody Allen film or a David Lynch film or a uh, Pedro, you know, that Spanish director, you know exactly what kind of film it's potentially going to be, you know. Tell me about uniqueness and about stamp on your brand, your uh, your savoir-faire. Which one or what would you consider as yours? Um, well, in my films? Yeah, as a prob filmmaker. Probably none of them yet um, because for me... Oh, <laughs> None of them, because for me over the years, um, the technology changed so much over the last few years that not having budgets, I had a few scripts that were really kind of quite budget scripts and they were quite visionary, but I needed a budget and I couldn't do them less than 25 million pounds, whatever. So it's like, okay, I have to work with nothing at the moment, right? I could go out there and do art-based films. But I made a lot of films over the year to learn the process, actually, technical process of shooting, learn how to direct, shoot, write, edit, almost to every single level. But actually not so much focused on the vision of the film. But from mm -hmm. now, which I'm trying to do a project that I'm doing called Mad World, this is probably the first project, and another project may be coming up as the first one that I go, this is going to have my stamp on it. You know, yeah. Everything else before was like a learning Mm -hmm. and process um, uh, technically and you know genre you make a genre film I'll go make yeah. a horror film but it's not really you're making a horror film because you know it as a horror market you know mm -hmm. but you still have to get your stamp on things today so I think from now on anything that I do I'm more no compromises I'm going to do things that I don't care who watches it 
I'm mm-hmm. just going to make what I want to make, you know? Yeah. You're and... going to stay, um, how do you say it? Um, uh, oh my God. Sometimes forgive me, forgive me because sometimes I forget my languages and I forget my, my <laughs> words in, in the languages I speak. But um, you want to stay um, oh, honest to your own, uh, to, to your, your. Uh, yeah, yeah, because we all, culture. yeah. We all compromise things because we compromise because we don't have the money. We compromise mm-hmm. because we think we're making something for a market, and we can't. Mm-hmm. But the only reason that you should do that is if you're going to get a budget from Hollywood, then you, you should be making something for a market because nobody's going to give you a hundred million and then you just think I'm doing my vision. No, it's for a market. It's a burger, you know. So then you should compromise. But I think today when we're making things for work, no money then we really should do what's in our heart and what we really want to do and what we really want to say, you know. Because I've made films for some films and I think, well, it's a horror market, make some money in a horror film, whatever. But you're not actually making what you really want to make, you know. And we all do that as filmmakers. We're all kind of guilty. I'll make something that maybe wins a BAFTA. Oh, this could maybe win a BAFTA. But that's not good enough reason to do it. You make something that you really want to make. And if it wins a BAFTA because of that, then that's fine. Um, So for me... Um, from now on, it's about making things that I want to make with zero compromises. And I don't care who sees it. I don't care if people don't like it, whatever. I've got, if I like it and, it and it doesn't work, that's okay. I've got to like it, you know. Um, and I probably should have done that years ago, you know, but I've came to a point now that I know how to actually come up with an idea, write a film, produce it, direct it, finish it. I've got the package every set, step of the way. Okay, I can do that. Okay, I've got to start making films that I want to make now, you know. Mm-hmm. So... In your opinion, is talent born or can it be created? I think I think everybody's got a little barcode inside them creatively. I think we're all creative inside. Um, if you look in TikTok and everybody wants to be a singer and a dancer, but they don't really do it because they've got the jobs. <laughs> I think everybody's got that little barcode inside to be creative, but I think most people ignore it or get caught up in everyday life or it's too risky. So in mm-hmm. terms of, I think everybody's got the potential for some talent and something creatively but they ignore it. Some people have got natural talent more than others and they ignore it and they go and become an accountant instead of a singer, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, and then some people get natural talent and think they can just ride on it and just, like I said before, that's enough and it isn't enough. So I don't think talent, I think it can be a bit born a little bit, but you have to develop that. I think you have to develop it. And especially today, where I go back to where I say talent's not enough. So you mm-hmm. have to... You know yourself reacting, you're going to film, you're constantly, you're going to constantly learn something new. You know, no matter how talented that you are, every time you come away from a project, you go, I could have done that better, I could have done this better, next time I'll do that better. So even if you get talent, you should be constantly, look at a lot of movie stars, there's a lot of movie stars that are actually really know that talented, but they're, they were really driven, you know. Um, so for me, talent, sorry, what was the question again? This is the worst, I keep going off the road. <laughs> I was asking you if talent is 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 natural. Is it born with the person, or can I, it? Be I, I think I think it can be born, but I think it also has to be absolutely developed. If you somebody plays a great piano and they're great at playing, that's practice. That's all practice and practice. Even if they've got natural talent, it's the same with acting as well. You know. As you know, when we study acting, the um, we usually they usually teach us how to get into character. But um, I don't think that they do teach uh, teach how to get out of it. Do you have any... <laughs> do you, yeah, people tend to take the character home. So do you have any technique of how to get um, uh, out of character, especially those who are um, emotionally complex? Are you talking about method actors here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not a method actor. I have my own method. So everybody, um, I think everybody's got their own method. Yeah. Yes. No. But I'm talking about. Um, it's. It, it is true that, um, especially the young, the young actors that they they study, they start their careers, their acting careers, uh, studying drama and drama schools, or yeah, 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 doing a lot of workshops and things uh, like that. And it is true that when you go to these film schools um, yeah. that they teach um, uh, uh, acting in front of camera, they do teach you, because I've been to a couple, and they do teach you how to get into character, um, how to get into a, a complex character, and, and which emotions from where you're supposed to be getting them, etc. And all this is very nice and very great. But they never tell you once you finished, um, okay, what am I going to do with this person who is attached to me now? Am I supposed to be throwing it in the bin before I leave the class? Am I supposed to shower to get it off? 
Am I supposed to have a drink? Whatever. What? I, I couldn't really answer that because I've never known a situation. I, I remember seeing an interview with Gary Oldman and they, they assumed that Gary Oldman lives in his characters and he says any actor that says they're living the character after it is full of it. Anthony Hopkins says, did you live in the character? And he says, I don't live in the character. I learn my lines and don't bump into the furniture. People think that those actors live the characters like Daniel Day-Lewis, you know. Yeah. So everybody's got a different method. Some people can switch it on and turn it off like a tap once they leave the set, you know. For me, I studied at the Lee Strasberg. I've only studied there a couple of months. Um, I found it quite, I didn't quite find it quite um, helpful because actually they were teaching us how to cry and I already knew how to cry. I just thought it, I just thought about the <laughs> several things in my life that made me cry. Um, so, but what I'm trying to say is, look, every actor's got a different process, right? I've worked mm -hmm. with actors that are quite methody, and um, and usually they say, David, I have to go over the corner here and get any character, and it's like, okay, just do you know what? Do what you need to do, right? If you've got a bag of tricks and you need to go into your bag of tricks and do your stuff, what you need to do. If you need to go in the bathroom and whatever. Do what you want to do, but just come back when the camera's roll and be there. I don't care what you need to do with your process, right? But I don't need you to tell me your process all day long, you know, what you need to do, because that's you, you know. Some actors need to be, hey, look, if you're doing a very emotional scene, you have to be, go away for a little bit and get into it. But for me, um, I think if you can get a very professional level where I've worked with some actors that as soon as, the minute the, before the camera rolls, a minute before, they're kind of laughing and joking, and then, then 30 seconds before they relax, and then, boom, that camera rolls, and they're a different person than crazy. And then the camera stops, and they're, they're, they're back, you know. Um, and I can understand that, because I think from those seconds that that camera rolls, um, or when you're on stage, um, you can get in that moment, it's a moment, you know, and you maybe experience the character, the circumstances, and you live it, but then you're gone. So for, I only come from an experience of working with actors and myself that I never walk on a set because I see the lights and I see crew and I see everything else. It's it's a set, it's a film. But in the moment that you're communicating, if you play table tennis with an actor really well, you can lose yourself in the moment. And I think if the camera captures that, you're in it. But once you're gone, you're out of it. Um, so I wouldn't teach anybody how to stay in a character or whatever because some of the best actors in the world don't even work like that, you mm -hmm. know. They're professional mm -hmm. enough that they can break like that and turn it on like, a, you know, because they've been doing it so long, you know, yeah. experience-wise. I think some actors just tend, especially young actors, tend to think, here's a simple example. I was to do a scene once and I was to get very emotional and beat somebody up. And, you know, it's like on a film, you're there and you're ready to go. I'm ready to kill somebody. I'm ready to go. I want to kill them now. And it's like, no, you need to wait. We're not ready to go. <laughs> so <laughs> tw 12 hours later, I'm like this. With a bottle of beer, I'm ready to kill somebody. I'm ready, <laughs> right, right. And all the energy was gone. Then I sat down and I, I looked at the script and I went, I bumped in the scene, I bumped into somebody on a table in a bar and then I was ready to kill them. Now, I didn't know I'm ready to kill them before that scene. I didn't know I was going to bump into somebody. So what I did was I relaxed, looked at the scene, went in the bar, bumped somebody on a table, didn't know how I was going to feel. And then their reaction back to me was like, looked at me as if we'd go to hell. And that just got me so angry with their reaction that bang, I got angry. I was in the moment, I was in the character. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about it. It's like Anthony yeah. Hopkins always says it, be more relaxed, be more open to things, just get relaxed into the scene and let the scene mm -hmm. take care of itself. Yeah. You know, and if it comes, it comes. And if it doesn't, it's the same as an emotional scene. Some people say, get emotional, or oh, you should cry at the moment. Some people don't cry when they've got bad news. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Some people do. Some people react in a different way. So I think you should just be loose with it. And I don't think you can, there's such a thing you should get in and out of character. You know, that's very individual process for each actor. Some some can do, you know, you know, that's my opinion anyway, you know. Yeah, no, no, um, I totally agree with you. I mean, you, you um, uh, earlier you, you did describe the way I am. Um, I, I can be telling a joke. And when you say, okay, we're ready, I turn around and I beat the hell out of someone. That's not yeah. my problem. And then I go back and I can and I keep on telling the joke. I mean, I have that, but I do understand and I do respect, have a lot of respect for my fellow actors that they do need a moment, that they do once yeah. they get into character, they are the character until we finish the day. 
And yeah. I respect that. And okay, it's fine with me. I can I'm, understand that. Yeah, I you know. That. I, mean, I think um, you, I think if you're in a certain mood, you want to keep in a certain mood. You don't mm -hmm. have to be getting jolly with crew all day long. You can keep a certain mood, but I don't yeah. think you have to go and live in a, a you know, and 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 you know. A, but look, I don't care how the actor does it. As long as they do it on the set and be professional, I don't care what they have to do to get you know to play the role. Honestly, you know, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> Tell us which of your projects have given you um, most visibility in the film industry as an actor and as a filmmaker. Probably the first one I hated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. I hate it. But, there, but, you're, but you're still here. Yeah, I'm still, still yeah. Well, because, yeah, well, if it's in your DNA, it's in your DNA, you know. Probably the first film because I was on national television with it, promoting it. Um, I had big billboards everywhere. There was a lot of press and media about it, and and I hated it. So I'm promoting it, and I don't like it. And I'm on TV shows talking about it, and I don't like it. I did, I had to really act and play a part there. That was probably my best role, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, probably, but hey, but the internet does different things that you don't expect. You know, you put your film on the internet, you put your film on Amazon, and then suddenly somebody will come back to you in an email and say they saw it in this side of the country or across the world, and you never, you never envisaged that this person would see it. So you know people that are seeing it all over the world, even though they don't always connect with you. So, uh, which is a great thing as well. Um, uh, but yeah, I've, you know, I've never, I've had the opportunities to to do bigger films, and I, I turned them down because I just I wasn't going to go back down that road of the first film that I didn't like. You know, um, I thought I just I don't even know if I'll be a filmmaker or actor. I'll experiment. I'll play. I'll build my way up, and maybe in my later years, if I can get to a certain level, then you know, I'll, I'll you know, and I've I've went off the train again. I don't know what the question was again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you did answer. The question was, yeah. uh, which of your projects do you think has given you more Probably that first one, yeah. As an actor yeah. and filmmaker. Ever. Yeah, yeah. What are your favorite genres in film as a spectator and as an actor-director? Um, probably the crime genre because I don't mean crime in the sense that gangsters and stuff. I mean crime that if you open the newspaper each day and you see the government robbing people, and you see corporations robbing, or if you see somebody that's just killed their husband and cut off their head and is wearing their head for a hat, that's quite, you know, all the mm. craziest crime that the human condition participates in every day, crime in general, because crime is something we see every day from the top level of governments to the top level of somebody that's lost the plot and killed their neighbours where went into your school and killed, you, you know. So crime is pretty much, crime is pretty much universal, you know. Um, even though that people don't always define things as crime, mm -hmm. you know, that are corporate crime and, you know, respectable crime, you know. So that's because of that. Um, quite like horror, but I'm not a horror. I'm not fully in horror because horror is probably crime because it's more character driven, you know, where you can do with crime. And the horror is much more, you don't see a great deal of horror serials as such as you do see crime serials because horror is very much in a genre that's to do with atmospheric. It can be character driven, of course, mm -hmm. but um, there's a lot of that, you know, um, horror is very, what I did like about horror was that when I shot a horror movie in America, America called Screen, I didn't have to, you know, it wasn't very much about character. It was more about atmospheric and cinematic. And I liked that because if you want to be a filmmaker and you be cinematic, you don't have to say much and you don't have to, so I enjoyed the experience in that. I'd like to do some more horror because of that as well. But probably character-driven horror as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably crime and horror. Um, and, and which I haven't done, which I'm going to do, more kind of experimental where it isn't a genre. It's more doing work that is, um, you don't want it to be defined in a genre. You just want to tell a story with a character and not think about what genre is this really. Um which we just are programmed to do when we make films these days. Mm -hmm. But be more experimental the way they were in the 70s and, you know, that you maybe come through with something new, you know, which mm -hmm. I haven't done, which I want to do more, which will be, this Mad World series is probably be going to be maybe about exploitation films mixed with crime and, and horror, maybe about comedy as well, black comedy, you know, but um, predominantly crime and horror, you know. Pro mm -hmm. Crime, sorry, crime, probably crime. As an actor... 
um, you know that uh, an actor is is no one but the person who gives life to a character who tells a story. And except in specific cases that the, char the character so requires, it knows not about ethnic um, groups, religions, genders, or sexual denominations. Would you say that we all have the same opportunity in this industry? Um, no, no, we don't have the same. No, obviously this in industry is, um, is, since the dawn of time is discriminated, if you mean that, you know, um, yeah, it does. Of course it does. And genders and male, female, um, absolutely. You know, it's no, there's no, PC ness, there's no, it, it does discriminate. There's no question about that. But I think things are changing because it's more fragmented. You know, mm -hmm. this industry hasn't got the same. Years ago, it was an industry. It was more like the big heads of the studios, the big heads of the media, but more it is more fragmented, independent. So people can, I think, take more control of things. But yeah, it's definitely, there's no question about that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you take female characters, years ago I used to, I, I seen a part with, a film with Anthony Hopkins and Judy Dench was playing his wife, Charing, is it Charing Crossroad with Anthony Hopkins? I remember seeing Judy Dench way back then and she's, well, why is she playing the wife? She's great, she was great in other things. And then of course years later she gets bigger roles and then she's playing more character driven roles. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I always used to look. Well, why is that actress playing that role? She's playing the wife again. But that's a, you know, she's she's great. But why is she just playing the bloody wife? You know. And yeah. um, but I think that's changing. You know, especially with Netflix and all these serials. You know, mm -hmm. I watched uh, Ozark, and some of the female characters in Ozark are insane. Uh, great roles. They're playing the bad. You know, they're the interesting roles. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think there's uh, there is. I mean, there's always been discrimination. Yeah. You know. Um, even even from my level, you know, when you were a Scottish actor twenty odd years ago, you couldn't get roles down in London because you were Scottish. Yeah. Until certain movies came out, like Train Spotting, and then Scottish was in vogue, and then Braveheart, then Scottish was in vogue, you know. And yeah. um, but you were a regional actor. Regional actors without posh accents weren't really seen, you know, the same. And there's still that today as well, you know. Well, that's what happens um, with with um, actors that. Um, they are stereotyped because of their ethnicity or their origins. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's just um, black actors. Um, of course, Arab right. Actors, uh, um, uh, Asian actors, Latinos. Absolutely. They can only do certain roles. But that's um, still today. That still happens right? today. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous because it's like I say, we are actors. And we are just um, giving voice to a character. And unless the character requires it, as, as I usually put the example of, okay, it's the life of a Chinese um, doctor who moves to Venezuela, then obviously it has to be a Chinese doctor. But if we're talking about the life of a doctor, an eight, a 25 year old doctor who goes to Venezuela and, um, and helps whatever, it, it can be anyone. It can be a man, it can be a woman, it can be a trans, it can be black, it can be white. The character <laughs> Character. The problem is, the bigger the movie is, it doesn't work like that in business. You know, mm -hmm. if you take a movie, right, and then if an actor, if a movie star suddenly comes out that they're gay, right, yeah. then they don't want to come out as they're gay because if they're working in the mainstream movie business and they're a big movie star, then the film is not going to sell in China because they don't want it or these other countries because they'll discriminate against certain factors. and So, so it's mm -hmm. a business, it's business decisions, you know, we don't want this actor in this country and that country. It's very, people don't seem to say it that way. It's not about who's right for the part and who's right for this. When you're dealing with corporations, it's very much market-driven, business-driven. They don't care who's right for the part. They care who's hot for the part. They care who has the biggest audience. They, they, they care who, well, if we go to that country, they don't like gay people, so we can't distribute it there. If we go to that country, they don't like this person, so we can't get a deal there. It's very much about that, where it's right, it's wrong, it is mm. wrong. But that's the way the movie business works. So if you're dealing with the movie business, the big corporations, but the more that this gets, you know, and, and smaller, independent, you know, um, business, that you don't have to rely selling all over the country, uh, the world that way, then the better. It can be more micro and more smaller and more. But yeah, when it comes to the big movies, of course it discriminates on every single level for all these other reasons. You know, um, you know, if it came out tomorrow that uh, George Clooney was gay or whatever, 
he's not his agents are not going to let him say that because his his films are not going to sell in all these territories all over the world. Mm-hmm. It's as simple as it's, it's a people don't seem to see that, but that's how it works. It's the same as Hollywood in the early, early days with Rock Hudson, you know. Yeah, but there are there are differences between, for instance, uh, commercial films and independent films, and I yeah. think that independent films are those who are giving um, much more opportunities to of um, course, yeah, yeah, all, all all types of actors, be whatever their origin or their religion or yeah. their well, gender representation is. They are given, and I think that's why platforms platforms such as Netflix and HBO and Amazon Prime are more into um, filming than whatever um, Hollywood, for instance, um, just, you know, going to, to, to commercial films. They don't really care. Uh, yeah. And especially now that it's so easy to, to, I mean, everyone, everyone has at least one platform at home. But that's um, why I get so angry when people down these streaming platforms because these streaming pr- platforms have also brought the film business alive with yes. a lot of great serials. They would never be seen. They would never be made. A lot of documentaries that would never be seen, never be made oh, about the world. So mm-hmm. there's an upside there where people say, oh, just want to protect cinema. But these films would never be made, you know. Um, so, yeah, look, even me, I'm 56 years old. You know, if I go out there and just look for certain acting roles, I'm only going, I'm getting to a level where I'm going to get the grandfather roles or this role or that role. If I make more in films, I can cast, I can be a 70-year-old hitman. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Clint Eastwood is still making these films at 90. He's a drug mule, you know. So um, I don't want anybody telling me, you're too old for this, you don't look like that, you sound too Scottish this way. Well, I can do an accent, but you do whatever. It's just the way the world is, but... You know, As you're saying, don't you think that it's up to filmmakers and and I mean, filmmakers, generally speaking, and screenwriters, it's up to them really to, to make this change because stories are about we could say what a, a, an eighty or okay let's let's be a less let's be nicer seventy percent of films are are no I'd say eighty percent of films are made and written for white people mm-hmm. and young people. Mm-hmm. Because, like I said, here in Spain, I can understand. I mean, now it's a go-go for young actors, but don't you think that people who are home, who are at home, which are our elders, they would like to see films or series with elder that, people? That's that's back to that's back to streaming as well. Where mm-hmm. years ago the, the cinema was geared towards the youth market, whatever. So yeah, like we're all we're all online, so we've got every demographic now. We don't have to stick to just making a film for this market or that market. You know, we can actually concentrate on niche. Niche yeah. can be huge. Niche yeah. can be. That's what I'm after. I'm after a niche audience. If you mm-hmm. get several thousand people and they become your fans, you can make a life with that. You know, so um, yeah, absolutely. But this is this is a great thing. Things are changing. Do you know what I mean? Because it is so fragmented. Yeah. You know. So, totally. You know. Do you think that castings are? totally necessary for professional actors or are there um, video reels and IMDb enough? Would you consider a simple cold reading via Zoom um, enough to see if that um, actor or actress is fit for the role? And do you usually do um, the castings for all of your projects or do you count or just rely on other casting directors? No, I've I've cast all my projects, and uh, some 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 roles I've cast without even seeing the actor acting, which sounds mm-hmm. insane. You know, they haven't even seen them acting. I've cast some roles that way, and I I go with my gut instinct about people. But here's the thing that I'm happy that if I see someone with a show reel, I just look at it thirty seconds, and that's what casting directors see because if you get thousands of them coming in, hundreds. Um, yeah. So I say, okay, that person looks that part. They might be that way. They're good enough acting. For me, or if they want to read a line, I've spoke to people online like this and read a few lines and I mean, that's it, I know right away. Um, mm-hmm. But that that's only one part of it. The other part that I do is that if I connect with actors over the years um, on social media, I follow them on streams and I follow them online. And if I like them as an actor, I look at the social and then you actually get to see them as a person. And yeah. if I know that I'm going to work with that person maybe for a long while, and then I look at the social streams and they're on there every day bitching about people and bitching about casting directors and bitching about the industry. Gone. <laughs> so it lets you get to see a person because if you see a CV and a spotlight, you still don't know much about the person. 
But the way you get to know about the person is through social. You can mm-hmm. see if they're consistent, if you can see if they're driven, you can see if they're blaming everybody else because they're not going to roll. Or mm-hmm. I don't want to work with people like that. I want to, I, I, if I've given if I've given somebody a solution, I don't want them to give me a problem, you know. Um, so it's very much about the person. It's almost like again, Christopher Nolan talked about Matthew McConaughey talked about a movie Interstellar, and Christopher Nolan came to his house and gave him the script, and they, they spent four hours. And he, and, he, and he later realised he just wanted to see who I was. He just wanted to hang out with me and find out what was I like, mm-hmm. you know. And I totally get that. Um, back to filmmakers want to find out what that person's like, not just about their acting. Okay, I see their acting. I want to know who they are, you know. Mm-hmm. I want to know um, how they treat people online, how they talk to people. And they don't seem to realise that. It's a, and that happens over months and maybe years. I've connected mm-hmm. with people for years on here. And then suddenly I'll just say that they've asked about for, for a role and then suddenly I've got a role that comes up and then I've liked them over the years and I go, they're perfect. I've been wanting to work with them for years. You know, so that's how I usually work. Um, yeah. Sometimes I get into trouble when I cast somebody right away that I don't know much about and that's when I usually get problems, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's usually when I've made the mistake. So, yeah, that's how I kind of cast. It's, it's, it's a combination of the, finding out about the person, mm-hmm. you know, as well as can they act, you know. Do you think that platforms such as um, Netflix, HBO, Amazon Prime, etc., are the only future for our industry? Do you think they will take over the cinemas? Yeah, the cinemas are. Well, the, I think the cinemas are going to be still there for a long time for the major blockbusters and the superhero movies, mm-hmm. and that's like a theme park ride movies. I think they're going to be there for a while. Um, I think independent cinemas. Anybody can set up an independent cinema if they do it right because people still like the experience of coming along, get q and A's there with their favourite actors or filmmakers. Mm-hmm. They can do they can evolve. If you evolve with that, that can still always be there. Um, so I think, um, sorry, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> I always go off. What was the question again? Do you think that these platforms will take over cinemas? Or um, are, and do you think they are the only future we have for our industry? Yeah, I think, I think, I think everyone can coexist, you know. Um, but I think what filmmakers have to do as well, that when filmmakers put their films on these platforms, like independent filmmakers, which is most filmmakers, to be honest about it, um, then you don't earn much money from these platforms. So you have to learn how to build a brand because you're not earning much money. And for me, on my next project on Mad World, I'm probably not going to be putting that on the big platforms because I think it's important. On the big platforms, you don't get your data. You don't get your information. You don't get your emails. You don't get any of that. Um, and that's how you build your audience. So for me, it's it's also a bit going underground and putting your work on platforms that you can drive your own fan base towards, that you okay. can exclusively get it here, get the data, give them extra stuff because of that. And if they're really into what you're doing, they'll go there. They don't need to go to Amazon or the big platforms. You know, mm-hmm. I've got so many people have seen my films on the big platforms, but they're not really people that connect with me. You know, mm-hmm. so I think. Um, but yeah, they're always going to be there. I think. I think everything can coexist. I don't think it has to be the cinemas have to go or the streaming, you know. But um, I think streaming has been the, sa- the saviour of the film business and serials and stories and small films that people would never see, you know. Totally. Well, talk about um, your projects. Tell us uh, about Wild One Films, your new blockchain company with an NFT exclusive membership. Think something that I <laughs> do not know. I am very ignorant in this. And um, which is going to start off with the anthology series Mad World. Tell us what does NFT mean? Oh, God. Um, What's the whole thing? Because I, I've heard about it. I have a friend who is in this too. He's starting this. I have no idea. Each time he talks to me, I still have no idea what he means and what it is. And I think that there are quite a bit of people who don't understand it. NFT, yet. most people don't know what NFT is. Basically, the NFT market exploded last year, a couple of years ago. It's always been there for a few years, but it exploded and went crazy. It, went, it was almost like a gold rush, right? Okay. Um, but basically, to put it simple, an NFT is um, if you buy, if you see the Mona Lisa and yeah. you take a picture of the Mona Lisa, okay. you, don't, right, you don't own the Mona Lisa, you just have got that picture. So okay. when people are selling, say, NFT art online, people go, well, I can just copy that, I've got that. No, that doesn't mean anything. You know, whoever owns the Mona Lisa has got a contract to say that they own the Mona Lisa, that one item. This is the only one Mona Lisa in the world. 
when you copy an NFT image, it's attached to a contract, which is called, called a smart contract. Okay. In some NFTs, you can also get that the image in a physical form, which is just the one image. You can also get an invite to an event. You can also get that image if it's turned into a movie or a series. You can also own a piece of that series or that movie or that intellectual property, which yeah. the NFT is like a contract. So it's all the, the threads that are a contract to ownership as something else, you know, which can't be faked. Nobody can fake it. If you get, um, if you buy a Gucci bag secondhand online, right, and you're going to pay a thousand dollars for it, and you don't know if it's the original. If you buy the NFT version that comes from the um, from the manufacturer, the person that buys it and wants to sell it secondhand will get an NFT certificate that proves that this is the original. This is a real bag. This is not a bootleg counterfeit. If you've got the NFT, that's impossible to fake. So when you get that bag. As as certification mm -hmm. as long as you get the NFT with it. So a, a lot of practical solutions are going to be NFTs over there. Ticket events, you know, if you buy a plane in 10 years' time, if you got a plane ticket, it's going to be an NFT. If you buy, you know, products. So the film business and the music business and the art business has been selling NFTs with the same thing. You maybe get a cut of a, a, an album. If you own that NFT, it's not just the, the NFT the album. It's the, the contract to say you may get a cut of that album. If that album makes a such and such amount of money, you got a cut of it. So basically for me, setting up an NFT film company, which um, was more last year because NFTs have took a dive because crypto's taken a dive. But NFTs are going to be the long term. It was almost like the early days of the internet. Everybody was buying into internet companies and then they lost a lot of money because it was too early and they said it was a fad. Well, obviously the internet wasn't a fad, but it was too early invest in internet companies and websites that weren't worth nothing. So yeah. everybody's been investing crazy amounts of money in NFTs mm -hmm. and a lot of people have lost money because they were making NFTs that were just copying the big mm -hmm. NFTs that were rubbish. So mm -hmm. NFTs are going to be the long term over the next few years. So for me, I don't see anything with the, the, the film company that I'm set up. It won't really go anywhere. It's the next few years. So here's an example. If somebody buys one of my NFTs, like a membership from the film company or a piece of one of my films, and in five and seven years' time, if I build up as a filmmaker, um, then they could have a piece of that film company, you know. And if it's made so many films and it's made money, they could have a piece of that. Also, say I have a big premiere one day and there's some stars there and I make a bigger film, um, then maybe 300 of the NFT holders, the original NFT holders, will get an invite. They go, oh, I've got the NFT, I can prove it, you come along. They'll only get in because they get NFTs. You know, so there's so many ways that you, it's a certification, basically. It can't be copied. It's impossible to copy it mm -hmm. through the blockchain. So, but people have been going crazy with it. You know, you know there's well, an artist. For instance, you know, not, for instance um, in your case, the NFT exclusive membership is not like being a shareholder of the company. Uh, basically, if I, only if I sell all these thousand memberships, I've got to sell the whole thousands of them because I'm not going to sell one membership and then somebody's got to cut your company, just one person. No. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I manage to sell them all over time, then basically, yeah, what they'll basically get is saying that every film that's ever made within that company is NFTs. Then each time there's a film goes out there, there'll be benefits from that. There'll be cuts from that, which I've put specified on the website. I haven't mm -hmm. plugged that a lot at the moment because the NFT markets took a big dive. Okay. I'm focused on actually making the films. And if mm -hmm. my profile builds, then people will want to buy the NFTs because people's, people aren't going to want to buy an NFT if they think that this person is driven is going to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. If they think this person is going to go nowhere, the NFT is going to be worthless. Do you know what yeah. I mean? That's why most 99% of NFTs are worthless because people see NFTs become popular, so they just made the NFTs, and then but they don't have an example. Somebody's made an NFT with a picture and say, "I'm going to make a game," but they've got no experience in making games. Whereas somebody like me says, "I'm going to make films." If you look back, I've got experience to make films. I do make films. That's what I do. You know, mm -hmm. whether I'm going to be really successful with it is up to you know history will you know the future will tell. So basically, it's ownership. You know, you're basically buying into different things mm -hmm. beyond the picture and the image. Okay. If I give you a poster tomorrow, one of my movies, and say, "Oh, you get one of my movies." Well, I've just got a poster here. That's like the NFT. It's just a poster. What does that mean? But I give you a poster with a contract. We cut your company. Oh, that's different. So NFTs connect to smart contracts. 
Um, mm-hmm. Because you can go online and when it's on a platform with OpenSea um, and you can sell on the NFTs. If somebody makes say, a, a course for a film, say I make a filmmaking course, right? If you buy the filmmaking course for uh, you know 20 pounds, right? Once you've watched the filmmaking course, you can sell it on to somebody else for a profit and they can buy it, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's many uses of NFTs, but it's still early days. It's very early days, you know. What advice would you give those who want to start this beautiful but uncertain industry? Um, I would say um, don't think about this as a career. Don't think about this, about earning money. Think about um, dabble in it where you want to be acting or filmmaking, especially today because you can start making films with phones. You can start acting with phones. Mm-hmm. So actually playing it like to see if you like doing it, to see if mm-hmm. you like the process, because it's one of the toughest businesses in the world, as you know. So you have, you've got to find out whether you like it beyond, oh, I want to be a star, I want to be this, and I want to be that. You have to just find out if you enjoy the process. So I think it's the best time today to actually do that, because when I started to make a film, I had to get quarter of a million pounds to see if I liked doing it. <laughs> and then I made a film that I didn't like. Whereas if you just um, make the film today for nothing, and then you can find out if you like doing it, if you like the process, because... Beyond that, you're going to have to build resilience and drive. and So I think you should just start by do, doing what it's acting, filmmaking. Just start by doing, start mm-hmm. by writing, start by enacting other people's projects or make your own projects or vice versa um, and to find out if it's for you, you know. Do you believe in giving back to the industry, not only with your knowledge but with your contacts? Yeah, I think I think we... I think today you should share your journey along the way. Not just share your journey when you've got somewhere, right, to try and sell a course. I think you should share your journey when you're at the lowest level and see how you're trying to build your way up. Mm -hmm. Too many people are trying to sell themselves. Oh, great things happening. Oh, I'm going to be, this is going to happen. Um, When actually a lot of people are kind of lying because they want to keep a front up online. If you go for an audition, you know, um, and you come out the edition, it didn't go very well. I think people should share that where they went wrong, where they went right, to show that that and what you learned from it. Well, I got a chance to audition. This was a, a chance to actually play a little part, and mm-hmm. then just share because somebody's going to get something from that. Because somebody, somebody will somewhere will feel bad about something, and they go, oh, "I felt better when they told me about that," you know. So yeah. I think you should just share your experience as you go along to actually show. To actually show you, I mean, I share a lot of my experience, but I want to show my son one day that you don't get things easy. You've had to mm-hmm. work your way up. Yeah. You know, it wasn't easy. I had to start from here. I had to, I had to do films that I didn't always want to do. Um, so I think we should all share that, but share it um, giving value because, you know, in social media, you're only going to get people, <laughs> you're only going to build if you're giving value to people, yeah. you know, and your sector, whatever your sector is, give value, you know, um, and share your experience there. And it also helps everybody else because if we're all trying to make good films and act in good films, the more we can make this better for each person, the more it's going to be better for us, you know. Um, in terms of sharing your contacts and stuff, um, uh, yeah, look, if you find talented people and you see they're really driven, you know, and they're doing well, then I've, I've done that. I've shared people where you should maybe... I've, I've, I've talked to filmmakers and said, check this person out, check that actor out, you know, and they've ended up casting them, you know, mm-hmm. stuff um, like that, you know. Would you, would you, would you say that um, networking is a must in this industry, being an actor or a filmmaker? Absolutely, but you, that's what's online today. I remember years ago, the only way you could network was just was go to film festivals, you know. You had to go to festivals if you wanted to network as a, a filmmaker. Today, is you can do a lot of it online. And that, hey, there's nothing beats face to face, you know, oh. being a real person. That's always the best, you know. But I think for those first initial impressions of people and connecting, you know, I, you've got to network absolutely because if you don't put yourself out there, if you, I'll wait, for, I'll wait until people come to me. They can see how talented I am. I'll just wait until they come. You know, you've got to put yourself out there. You know, I've got, I've got a project at the moment that. Um, that's probably one of my biggest opportunities to be in part of somebody's project. But I've had to put myself right out there and contact them and be enthusiastic and because I believe in it and I'm excited about it. So I've had to put myself right out there. Um, I haven't talked about it online, it's privately. Um, but yeah, you've got to network, absolutely. You've got to sell yourself because if you don't sell yourself, there's so much noise today. People are not even going to see you. 
you know. Yeah, sure. you if, know. You could, if you could go back and forward in time, what would you say to your past you and to your future you? Don't get any acting. <laughs> <laughs> Filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> I do everything else. Um, no, I don't want to say that. I don't want to say that because the creative industries, I think, is a great industry. The creative industries, I think, are really important to our culture and our world and our, our mental state and we're identifying with each other. And, you know, so I don't have any regrets there. Um, I just have um, many regrets that I would do things differently. You know, I would get more business minded. Mm -hmm. um, creative industries people tend to let all their business brains go out the window especially filmmakers it's like how are you going to make a living with us how are you going to monetize with us same way acting how are you going to do it what should make sure your day job is going to be try and get a day job that you like as well um because you're going to have to probably do that for a long time as well as the acting so um just get more business like and more savvy and more that you're on a long road if you want to be in the creative industry. So, so have something else that you, but not something else too much that you would maybe, if you get a job that you like too much, you might drift from your creative stuff because you get caught up with the comfort and the trappings of life. Mm -hmm. It's a fine balance, I think. So for me, um, I keep drifting from the question, Jasmine. <laughs> is that? It's because you're enjoying the moment, and you're. I get lost in the moment. That's what it is. I get lost in the moment. You know. Yeah, that's you know. great. But yeah, that's something I have with people. I, I make them lose their 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 mind in the moment, and they just don't remember. Um, yeah. We're getting to the end of the interview. I'm so sad because it's it's been so nice talking to you and just listening to you, but unfortunately, we're getting to the last question. Um, as I say, this is not a gala award, but if uh, you had this moment to be able to thank anyone and no music is going to start, just tell you to shut up or if leaves aren't going to fall so you can't <laughs> or whatever. So who would you like to thank? Um, oh, look, every, every, you know, in terms of thanking just for... Um, I think everybody that, that even looks at your stuff online every single day, everybody online, put it this way, people online, that some most people I haven't met online, right? There's people that I've connected with for many years all over the world, and they've been far more supportive than people that I've known in my real life, you know, um, which is very, very strange. So there's many people that I've connected with over the years, Um that um, I haven't managed to meet yet, like most of us haven't met, you know, face to face. So those people that keep encouraging you to keep going, which I've passed on to other people, hopefully, you know, they're the biggest to thank. Um, that they've gave, uh, you know, monetary support for projects. They've gave moral support. They've gave, you know, sharing your stuff and and even like this, you on here like this and talking to me. Those people keep you going, keep you driven. That's the, people talk so much about the internet, how bad it is. But mm -hmm. for me, the good stuff outweighs the bad stuff, you know. Um, so all those people, there's too many, too many people to thank. Person, you know, like say their names. There's too many of them, you know. But mainly internet people, maybe all the people online, you know, which isn't internet people. It's just people, you know, you know. Uh, yeah, you know. If that answered the question, I don't know if it did, you know. Well, yeah, it did. It did answer the question. I mean, as you say, um, as you said, everyone counts. Every bit counts, and everyone counts. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we are made of moments that we share with people, and those people are the important people who are in your life. Some um, bring negativity, which teaches you and show you things, and some just bring you beautiful moments, which you have to cherish. Learn to cherish both because. Without the negative, positive wouldn't exist. So um, yeah, I'm good with it. I, I can take the negative as, as well because that's usually people that are hurting if they give you negative stuff all the time. Unless mm -hmm. it's good criticism, but it's usually people that usually nasty people. They're hurting, so you usually you usually end up giving them empathy because you go, you know, it's like why do you get out of bed in the morning and start having a go at a stranger? There's something wrong with you, not me. You know. Yeah, you know, true, true, you true. Know, true. So. Well, David. <clears throat> Thank you so much for sharing your afternoon and your experience with us on Coffee Time by Yasmin Oh. 
And thank you all for being here with us today and always supporting culture, because as I say, life without culture is quite boring. You can all follow David's works through his social media, links included in, in the interview description on my YouTube blogcast and on my IG. And if you wish to know who will be my next guest, well, you will have to follow my social media. Take care, be responsible and enjoy life. As we say here in Spain, we only have four days and three rain. So, Thank you again, everyone. Thank you loads, David. I hope that this will only be one of the first of many other interviews that we will have. And I hope to see you soon in the big screen. Thank you, Jasmine. Really appreciate it. And thanks for everybody at watch. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.